what inspired you to undertake this book about the connection of humans with animals in the natural world? Leah, you go ahead as it was your idea. Um, yeah, look, ideas, ideas are kind of without meaning to belittle them. They're a dime a dozen. <laughs> so I can tell you about the idea, but I think the, the story of the execution of it is, is much more interesting. But basically I was sitting, it was during the, the 2019, 2020 bushfires in the summer. And I remember sitting at the dining room table um, writing and and watching the news feeds and you know billions of animals wildlife being destroyed just feeling so inadequate and like just what do I do what impact could I possibly have um, and I opened the window and you know I was in Melbourne in, in you know wasn't physically affected by it um, and I opened the window and it was was one of the days where the fires from Gippsland, all the smoke just came pouring into the house. So it was palpable all of a sudden it was there. And I just thought I've got to do a fundraiser for animals. I've always loved animals. Um, you know, didn't get into vet school, got into medical school instead. <laughs> so don't tell my patients that. Um, and I just had this idea of inviting uh, writers to sort of write a love letter to Australian animals and, and use it as a fundraiser um, for conservation and pitched it to my publishers at Penguin who were just so supportive and just incredible. Everyone, just everyone across the board wanted to do this book and, and work on it pro bono. And so then it was a fait accompli. It was, okay, Leah, go ahead and, and put this anthology together. I'm like, oh, God. And I, I had met um, the beautiful Meg Keneally a couple of years earlier at Brisbane Writers Festival and fallen in love and <laughs> had a huge girl crush on her and rang her up out of the blue, said, Meg, blah, 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 blah. And I hadn't even got my sentence out of, do you want to be a co-editor on this book? And there was it, an overwhelming yes. So, you know, she's in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne, and that was the start of a lot of emails and phone calls. And so, and so Meg, what, 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 what about the project made you go, yes, wow, without thinking any more about it? Well, um, I just, I had just the day before seen a social media post from Wildlife Carer, who um, was cuddling um, a koala joey um, and a young wallaby both of whom were on their way out. They were too badly burned to survive. And her caption was, sometimes all you can do is be with them when they go. And I was just, that, that, that really, really got me. And it, I think it brought home the cost that the natural world was paying for this bushfire catastrophe. Uh, and I felt, as Leah said, really helpless. I mean, I've been raised to support the firefighters and that's really important. But I think that post more than anything else brought home to me emotionally something that I'd already known intellectually, which was that long after these fires were out, the natural world would be, would be suffering. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I've... I contribute to charities, but I'm no good at organising. I'm no good at fundraising. I'm no good at any of the skills that would normally be useful to a charity. And I had been thinking not long before Leah called, what can I possibly do beyond and feeling frustrated that I couldn't find a role for myself in, in helping in this. And so when, you know, it was the timing of Leah phoning was just incredible. I'd literally just been thinking, what can I do? How can I contribute? Because there is that helplessness when you're faced with that massive destruction. And just to have something to grab onto, something that I was actually equipped to do, you know, there's not much I'm good at, but words I'm okay at. And I thought, this is something I can actually contribute. And how did the two of you select the authors who contributed to the anthology? It was uh, we, everyone we we could think of. We contacted basically. We, it was sort of, we put together this huge wish list of you know people mm -hmm. we thought would be 
impossible to get because Meg our deadline was pretty crazy yeah it was we had you know the publisher had I think the publisher had said to you in January yeah great we want it on bookshelves by November so can you get it to us by May and I think at that point that was when you set your hair on fire and ran around and then called me (laughs) because (laughs) <laughs> it was a bit like that but we got together we got together a wish list thinking mm. well you know we'll put down a hundred names and there were so many people we could have added to the list and we thought well you know no not many people are going to say yes straight up um and to our absolute delight I think there were one or two that couldn't make it for logistic reasons but you know the first sort of I think it was 40 plus people on our wish list absolutely just wrote back so enthusiastic and so generous it's like my god you know you're going to write an, a fresh essay of a thousand words in two months and get it to us <laughs> like, yeah. ah! but no money because uh, that, no money I'm, yeah <laughs> that, that's the I mean I think that's the other thing that was just so working on this was an absolute joy even in those days when obviously a project like this there are always going to be hiccups and snarls and that sort of thing and snags but um it was a joy to work with Leah and it was also um just so wonderful because no one involved was paid including us and the willingness of people to contribute their time and talent for nothing was really inspiring the list of writers is is extraordinary. I mean, if you wanted to get a list of, you know, as you said, 30 or 40 of the absolute best Australian writers, you you nailed it. So your, your contacts are extraordinary. Um, <laughs> but um, for I those who have- I'm going to interrupt there for a moment, sorry. I, I just, they're not just writers. No. They're also, you know, we've had scientists, we've had young ecologists. Um, for, for those of, yes, yeah. for those who haven't read it uh, or seen it, and without, without uh, sort of, um, <laughs> Uh, being seen to play favoritism do just just you know just give the names of six or ten of the people just so that people out there will just get a sense of of who of who contributed yeah do you oh want gosh. to name a few we've got anyone from Geraldine Brooks through to well you know Tom Keneally that's a bit of nepotism there yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was no way he was getting away with no nepotism. he couldn't say no <laughs> and then I have to admit you know, did the Jewish mother thing of my two daughters who are ecologists. Yep. Um, Sean Tan, Graham Simsium, Bruce Pascoe. Um, Paul Kelly, Tony Burt, Tony, Tony Burt, Paul Kelly. Tony, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. Robbie, Robbie Arnott, who was on um, this year's uh, shortlist for uh, the Miles Franklin, yeah. who wrote an extraordinary piece about thresher sharks. Yeah. and Yeah, I mean, yeah, there were so many and, and we could have added more... <laughs> <laughs> did you, so the next question I've got, uh, uh, did you work with any of these authors during the writing of the essays or did they just send you their final draft and you went magnificent? I mean, what, what was the process? We, we just, uh, we, uh, they, most of the time they just sent us a final draft. Another, another thing I should mention as well in relation to the writers is we, we were really, we really wanted a big Indigenous representation uh, in the book. And we were fortunate enough to get um, people like Claire G. Coleman, whose book, Terra Nullius, I'm absolutely obsessed with. It's an amazing book. Um, uh, and her, her next one, The Old Lie, is amazing as well. And she wrote about, um, uh, she's a, a Willaman Nunga woman, and she wrote about Wurlo, in other words, the uh, the bush stone curlo- curlew, which is the sort of representative animal of her um, her ancestors. Uh, so that kind of connection to country that goes back tens of thousands of years, I think, was absolutely absolutely crucial to include in the book. We had um, Tony Birch, as we mentioned, Curly Saunders. Um, uh, um, Nayuka Gori, uh, a, a, a lot of incredible Indigenous writers, and they were all just incredible. Um, and in terms of working with them, we just said, write about whatever you want, because the key thing was for them to write about something that they felt a personal resonance with. 
and it was like Christmas, wasn't it, Leah? Every couple of days, a new essay would hit our inboxes and we'd read them and ring each other and squeal down the phone. We did a lot of squealing. <laughs> um, squeal down the phone about how gorgeous they were. Yeah, it was sort of, for me, it was like the eight days of Hanukkah, except it extended out to about 80 days because it was during lockdown. And I'd come home from the clinic and there'd be these beautiful essays. And not just that, we haven't even mentioned the photographers who yes. just made the book. I mean, Absolutely. stunning photos. So we would just say, look, write about an animal that you've, you know, that you've had an encounter with or that you love or, you know, something about the Australian, Australian wildlife. And we, you know, Emma Viskich, um, who's mm -hmm. a wonderful crime writer, wrote about an animal I'd never heard of who I've subsequently yeah. fallen in love with called a, a Fascagale, a brush tailed Fascagale. Whoever knew. Know, they're extra. Anyone who doesn't know what a Fascagale is, because I had, I'd never heard of them either, needs to immediately Google it because they're incredible. <laughs> They've sort of got a tail like a toilet brush, they're just beautiful. <laughs> the boa, I think, Leah, not Oh, sorry, yes, a boa, that would be much more. <laughs> well, what was the connection between the, the photography and the writing? So um, did you have any uh, stories that you wanted to be told because you had access to particular images or did the images just come after the writing or, or were photos taken because or were they existing stock? So tell me about the photographs and the linking with the, with the, with the writing. Um, they were uh, they were existing, so we we definitely wanted the visual element because it makes it that much more powerful. But because the writers were writing about something which they had a personal emotional stake in, uh, they were the ones who really had to choose the species or the ecosystems or the topics they were writing about. And then that drove us to go out to uh, some incredible photographers um, who were in hugely generous with their talent um one photographer um uh, uh i'd like to mention because she contributed so much is georgina statler who is a former um wildlife photographer of the year who specializes in birds but we had all sorts of incredible um photographs by william terry who's a fascagale um expert um, uh, and who has some of the only photos of that that species in existence? Just uh, we were just so grateful to all and of Christian them. Christian Bell, who Christian Bell, who took that's the, the cover. cover. I mean, look at. The, I know we've got possums in the garden, but come on, yeah, <laughs> look at that yeah. little face. <laughs> as soon as I, as soon as that photo hit our in, inbox, I thought, "There's the cover." Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we we even had um, there was a wonderful lady who is a firefighter in the Blue Mountains near Sydney and we, a, a keen scuba diver in her spare time and we were hunting everywhere for an image of a thresher shark and they're not an easy species to to spot to go with Robbie Arnott's piece and um, eventually got these incredible images from a firefighter in um, the Blue Mountains who was very kind to let us let us uh, display her work. Another was from a scuba diving friend of mine who had some wonderful photos of, um, uh, of marine species. Jane Jenkins, who is um, a, a, a well-known marine photographer, contributed heaps of images. I mean, we could, we could go on, but every single image in that book uh, Wayne Suffield, who took some incredible photos. Every single image is extraordinary and I think just allows the writer's words to sing. And also what, what was so exciting is that um, Meg in her other life is a scuba diving instructor. So I didn't realise at the time that I was sort of pairing up with a mermaid <laughs> who had a very special relationship with this guy. Yes, that's my that's my friend oh. George the Blue Groper. Um, so we've divided the book up into um, air, uh, water, and land, mm -hmm. and so the water aspect really um, Meg excelled in. <laughs> Were there any particular animals at the very beginning that you wanted to focus on, or you you knew you had to have in there? Uh, or, or at the end you went, this is missing, we need to chase that? No, up. no, because we also didn't want to just focus on the charismatic animals. I mean, you know, we all know about 
kangaroos and koalas and, and, and very important, but we wanted this to come from the heart of the people that wrote the story. So, you know, we've got um, Nick Porch, who's a, um, in, a professor of insects, <laughs> who's written about his love of particular beetles. Um, Ewan Ritchie writes, is a, is a um, conservationist and scientist who writes about dingoes. So everybody, getting these scientists to write love letters to the creatures they've spent their lives studying and, and getting that that beautiful lyrical love letter rather than a academic paper, I think was the most exciting thing. And some of the essays that are my favourites come from scientists, which needed a little bit of editing and polishing, not a lot, but I think just to get the scientists' emotion come out. John Wojnarski um, writes about, you know, how, how scientists cry, you know, just mm. yeah. who would have thunk? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, an interesting thing did happen when we asked them what made you spend you, decide to spend your life studying this species. And, you know, we had stories of, um, uh, you know, the greater glider um, weeing on the wristband of one scientist and that smell that yeah, he the mine, yeah. glider reminding him of when his children were young. Uh, we had... Uh, um, uh, Nick Porch talking about parting the uh, the leaf litter on a forest floor and finding a metropolis mm -hmm. under there, you know, all of that. So it it, it it's just just in, in, incredible to be able to ask not only why do you love this species or this ecosystem, but why did you decide to make it your life's work? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about the book is that it it really um, it really crystallizes to me uh, that. I and I think a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about the world around us. We're so focused on our own lives and human interaction and what have you, but we are, you know, surrounded when we go for our walks in 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 and out of lockdown. Mm. Uh, we are surrounded by creatures that are, that are just you know that are such an important part of the ecosystem. Ecosystem. We should stop and ponder and and not keep walking all the time and just stop and look at them and 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 watch them. Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting because the pandemic being a horrible time in so many ways, I find personally has focused my attention on what's in the natural world just outside my front door. There's a creek at the bottom of my street and I walk along it every single day. And I know it now and I know its rhythms in a way I never would have otherwise. I know which part of it the flying foxes like to dip down on into for a drink when they're on their night flight. I know where a particular baby possum likes to sleep. Um, uh, I know the sound the bush turkeys make when they're trying to build one of their incredible mounds. You know, I, I sort of feel I have a connection to it that I wouldn't have had had I not been in a position where essentially my only outdoor time is down at that creek. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, getting every day, getting another story in your inboxes and squealing with delight. Uh, the last question that I've got for you is the hardest one you have to answer. Um, and that is with which story did you most connect and why? So it doesn't have to be a favourite one. You know, you don't have to be favouritism, but, you know, which which one made you squeal the most for whatever reason? And, and, and what was the reason? So many of them made us squeal for so many reasons. I love Leah's story about the Pacific oh. black ducks, <laughs> ringy and stormy. That's just because you found out what an evil character I really am. Yeah, Leah's got an ATO file. <laughs> I, as a student, supported, um, I, I, I worked at Sacco's Continental Delicatessen on Saturdays in Glen Huntley Road and made $4 a day, I think it was, or possibly $4 an hour, I can't remember. Whatever I made, I contributed to Laurie Levy's oh. nascent um, coalition against duck yes, shooting. Yes. And too scared to actually go out and do anything myself and be an activist. Um, so I sponsored a wild duck for years. And when the Freedom of Information Act came out, I wrote and thought, I wonder if I've got an ASIO file. Like, why would I have an, oh, such a neb? Um, and lo and behold, my folder came in the mail and there I was under ASIO's gaze because I supported this organisation. Ah. 
Well, there um, you go. Gosh, I want to say I want to say that Megs is one of my favourites too, <laughs> because of George. <laughs> George the Blue Groper, he's 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 wonderful. Um, but there are so many. I think rather than highlighting one. I think some of the stories I really connected with were when people wrote about not only their love of the species, but what the species has meant in their life, whether as it's a way to recover from trauma uh, or a way to feel still connected with the world when you can only go outside to shop, you know, <laughs> um, uh, because that, to me, really spoke to the to, to the title of the book "Animals Make Us Human." It's it's not, and I, and I know it's arrogant to look at them through a human lens and think, well, what what's in it for me to have this relationship? But at the same time, I felt that they really, uh, and that's not the intention of the book at all. The the um, the intention is to highlight the interconnectedness of us and the fact that we are hardwired to need these creatures and we better look after them a bit better because we do need them. Uh, and so the stories that spoke to that I particularly connected with. I really loved a story by Antoinette Rowe who um, lives near Carnarvon, Indigenous woman who kind of is the ersatz guardian of, some, of um, a species called the Dawson's burrowing bees. And she writes about growing up as a kid and, and just these bees were just everywhere. Um, but it was very special for me kind of having that little window into her life growing up and, and, and being kind of the protector or guardian of these bees. These females dig into the um, ochre earth and then once a year there's this absolute swarm of males all competing to mate with her and she pokes her little head up out of the burrow and there's like just, you know, thousands of boy bees trying to get her and chase her and um, all the boy bees end up basically killing each other just to get the girl. Um, I kind of like that story a bit. Yeah. I think what, another, another one that, you know, to that point of humans needing animals that I found incredibly moving was a story um, on the magpie life by Naoka Gori, who wrote about when they were in hospital um, having their twins and how their world was, you know, limited to the hospital confines, uh, except for this little lark that they'd see, um, you know, in the, um, in the courtyard and how that sort of helped them through a particularly emotional time. Mm. Was there, and, and was there just, again, just, connected to this then what was the most surprising thing you discovered in reading of these apart from the existence of fasca girls um <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know I, I don't know if it was a surprise but i was just so warmed by people's passion mm. for nature and for Australian wildlife and I mean there's a Jewish um, you know tikkun olam sort of you know healing the world and that the, the timeliness of that for me you know I know this isn't going to make a huge difference to our cataclysmic you know climate change and everything else but if we all do our bit and, and this book went to supporting all the funds went to um, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and the Australian Marine Conservation Society um, and I, for me, it just, just the, the overall collective passion and feeling like we all care that everybody really wants to make a difference in some way um, was really warming. I would have loved it to be, you know, to have raised thousands more, <laughs> maybe your viewers will buy more exactly. copies, but um yeah, that, that was really heartwarming for me. And, and it, you know, that people, read it and also feel that passion and hopefully that will make people more aware of, of the plight of our very very special and threatened indigenous wildlife yeah i think what um what surprised me was you were asking earlier about how whether there were any species that we felt were missing and that we needed to chase up 
all of the species people chose were really interesting and really not, um, as Leah said, the big stars of uh, the animal pantheon. We didn't have anyone writing about kangaroos, for example. Um, uh, and not that I have anything of it against kangaroos, quite the reverse, but it was refreshing to get to know some of the less celebrated animals. And even a lot of them were in a, in a, in a domestic context. Um, for example, uh, Geraldine Brooks wrote about looking up at a huntsman spider on her wall who's looking back. Um, Sean Tan wrote and did an incredible um, mm. illustration uh, of uh, a red wattle bird who, when he was a little boy, he it fell from a tree and he nursed it back to health in his, you know, sort of suburban um, area. Uh, so yeah, it, it it was it was just really tender, and I think the surprise was not only the diversity of animals, but how 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 deeply people felt about them. Look. And also the, the kind of um, the ripple effect, Angela Savage, who's a wonderful writer and who yeah. was on our wish list, but kind of, you know, everyone had said yes beforehand. She um, got together an entire army of craftivists to crochet and knit all the animals in the book. Mm she called it literary critters so if you look at the hashtag literary critters on instagram or facebook I've seen, you'll see I've seen them online the now magic. on on facebook as she did each one it was extraordinary they yeah. are beautiful and then we we you know um could send each of these creatures as a gift to the writers and that was astonishing yeah at, at first they th however they were all sent to penguin random house for a class photo <laughs> uh, and uh, um uh, the lady on whose uh, desk they all congregated said she'd never been more popular because everyone at Penguin Random House was popping by for a bit of a cuddle. <laughs> Even my son popped in. He lives in Sydney and he came in for a photo shoot. It's the best photo. It's better than his bar mitzvah photos. <laughs> all these animals surrounding him. I got you got to put that on Tinder, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Look, um, uh, thank you. You've, you've written a, you, well, you've compiled an extraordinary book. And I think the best thing about it is that it's, it's not going to date. It doesn't date. It's, it's just, you know, it'll go on and on and the, and the, hopefully the money will continue to flow to these wonderful organizations, but it's, it's, it's going to be as relevant, you know, in five and 10 years time, because mm. it, it's, um, it, uh, it captures what, it captures something that is, is, is everlasting and that is our connection and, and the importance of animals in our lives so thank you so much for 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 editing the book and of course for joining us today for this chat thank you for thank you so much for having us and thank you maggie for the wonderful questions <laughs> <laughs>